Um, so inshallah tonight we are going to talk about the five secrets of lasting love. I do know that um, it was kind of advertised as the Sunnah and Science of Marriage, which is a workshop that I teach, but that's actually a full weekend workshop that's about 12 hours, 6 hours on Saturday and 6 hours on Sunday. So inshallah tonight, um, what I've done is I've taken some of the most critical aspects of that workshop, condensed it a little bit for you guys, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, has anyone heard me speak before? One person. Okay. So I have a rule, um, and the rule is that if I say prophet, we all say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you want to know why, um, this is an infograph that I actually shared on my website. And if you actually go on my website and click on this infograph, you'll see all of the hadith supporting the points. But it's so important for us to send peace and blessings upon the Prophet And one of the reasons why um, is because we get so much reward and so many blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what? The Sahaba saw that the Prophet وسلم, was in sujood, but he wasn't in salah. So he just made a sajda. And he prolonged the sajda. And when he got up, he was so extremely happy. And uh, the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, like, why did you just make sajda? Why are you so happy? And he said, Because Jibreel just came to me. And he said, you know, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, won't you be pleased to know that when someone says salams to you, I say salams to you. And when we say, send peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends blessings upon us ten times. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders the angels to write for us ten good deeds and erase ten bad deeds from our books and elevate our ranks on the day of judgment, ten darajah. So imagine if we say it ten times tonight. Anybody really good at math? We say it ten times tonight, yes. How many, how many good deeds will we get if we say it ten times? One hundred, good job. So imagine getting a hundred good deeds and a hundred sins erased and having your rank in Jannah higher by a hundred levels. So inshallah, that's my rule. And I hope and I pray that um, inshallah we're all, we're all able um, to send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu And what I usually ask people to do is to say it in a way where the person next to you will actually hear you. Anybody want to guess why? Perfect. Jazakallah khair. So in case that person next to you forgot, when you say it out loud and you remind them, do you know what happens? You get double the reward, inshallah. Why? Because the Prophet said, The one who initiates something good and someone else follows gets the reward of that person without diminishing their reward. So inshallah, that's my rule. So, Inshallah, we're just going to get uh, right into our topic. And before we start, I just have to uh, make a, a disclaimer. So this class is meant to be psychoeducation, not psychotherapy. And so a lot of times as a therapist, when I teach lectures or workshops, uh, people expect some kind of counseling, right, psychotherapy. When in reality, what we're doing is we're doing psychoeducation, and that's one of the um, areas that I'm focusing on right now because I realize that by teaching people the tools that they need, inshallah, we can prevent a lot of the problems that the brother was talking about in our relationships. So inshallah, um, bismillah, let's start. So we all know that beautiful ayah that's on almost every single wedding card, right? The ayah from Surah al where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and of his signs is that he created from you, from yourself, mates, so that you may dwell in tranquility in them. And he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, placed between you affection and mercy. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, in that is a sign for the people who give thought for the people who reflect. 
And so one of the most important things that we have to understand about marriages is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this union between two people is a sign, a miraculous sign from him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he also says that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who places love and mercy between the hearts and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of our hearts, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that our hearts are between the fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he turns them as he wishes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who controls our hearts and controls our spouse's heart, right? And so we have to really understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. And we have to always seek his help and go to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, jalla fi ulam. So, do we have any professionals here? Obviously, yes. Okay, what do you do, brother? Um, healthcare consulting. Healthcare consulting. So, to do that, do you have to get any type of training? Lots of training, right? Lots of education. Um, if you want to do anything in life, what do you have? What's the prerequisite usually? Some kind of learning, some kind of training, right? So if I wanted to be a dentist, I would have to go to dental school, right? Pharmacist, pharmacy school. So with everything in our life, we have to. What if I speak really loudly? Is this better? Yeah. Okay, this is going to work just temporarily, okay? Because we can't call for too long. So everything that we want to do in life, we have to learn about it. We need some type of education, correct? Then why is it that the most, one of the most important decisions that we make in our life, one of the things that we will spend the rest of our lives doing, we literally get no, no type of training, no type of education. I'm going to give you an example, okay? So, Hamdan and I give a lot of khalaqat where I live in Dallas. And usually, whenever there's a wedding, I get a phone call. I'm like, Sister Dunya, can you please come speak at my daughter's wedding? So, about six years ago, I, I got that call. And I'm like, okay, sure, Sister, you know, just give me the details, and inshallah, I'd love you. And so, the day came, and I went to the wedding hall. And when I walked in, uh, the mother of the bride greeted me. Like, thank you so much for coming. But before you actually speak at the wedding, can you just come with me for a second? And I'm like, okay, sure. And so I go to her, and we, I remember we go into the elevator, we go up, and we get to one of the rooms in the hotel. And she opens the door, and I'm so confused, and it's the bride getting ready. And so she kind of introduces me to the bride, and I'm thinking, okay, she wants me to meet her daughter, great. And then she looks at me and she's like, you know, um, can you just give her a call? Can you just talk to my daughter? And I'm like, talk to your daughter? And then she closes the door and she laughs. And I sat with her daughter, who literally, she's getting married in an hour. And in our conversation, I realized that it's not working. Oh, it's working now. Perfect. So in our conversation, um, while I was talking to her, I realized she knew nothing about relationships. She didn't even know the thick of marriage, like the basics, like the fact that she needed to make ghusl, right? After being intimate. She didn't know anything about conflict resolution. You know, a lot of times, and I'm gonna be talking a little more about this tomorrow, a lot of times I give assessments to couples who come to see me and these assessments are about their own selves. It should take about five minutes to answer the 10 questions. And for 45 minutes, they're looking at the paper and they're completely stumped. Because a lot of times we don't even know about our own selves because we never took the time to sit and reflect. 
and ask ourselves. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is we must learn and get training for everything in life. But why don't we learn or get any type of training for one of the most important relationships that we're going to have in our lives, which is our relationship with our spouse, spouses. And so I just wanted to congratulate you all for being here because you guys actually took that first step. And I pray and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you for that and to reward you immensely and to grant you spouses and children that will be the coolness of your eyes. So before we begin, um, I just wanted to remind us all about our intentions. So how many people here are married? Mashallah, okay. So if you're married, I want you to renew your intention, inshallah, right now, and know that your path to a better marriage will start today, inshallah. Because like we said, you just took the first step. And in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll begin. And let's purify our intentions. Take a second to really purify our intentions and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us get the marriage that we've always wanted, that we've dreamed of, the relationship that we long for. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I pray that he makes it easy for us. And I want to remind you, you all of an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if they both desire reconciliation, if the spouses desire to reconciliate and to become closer and more loving and more affectionate, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will cause it between them. So make that intention inshallah right now. And if you're not married, for those of us who are not married, let's make the intention that we're learning so that inshallah when we do get married, we can have that beautiful, harmonious, and healthy relationship. And know that acquiring knowledge is one of the greatest forms of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when we learn, right, when we acquire knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, are those who have knowledge and those who don't have knowledge equal? No, right? Those who have knowledge are superior in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're acquiring that knowledge and one of the greatest pieces of knowledge that we can acquire is that marriage is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why am I saying it's a gift? Because in Surah Al-Furqan where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Ibad al-Rahman, he describes his beloved servants. He, he quotes them as saying, Those who say, O oh our Lord, gift us. Hiba is a gift. Have then a gift us for amongst our spouses and our children, our offsprings, to be the coolness of our eyes and allow us to be an example and lead the righteous. So marriage is a beautiful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, everybody wants a happy and fulfilling marriage, correct? Do you think there's anybody in the world who will tell you, no, you know, my goal is to have an unhappy marriage? No, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way he describes marriage is what? Is a source of tranquility, right? Tranquility, peace, mercy, love, affection, right? And so everybody wants and wishes for a happy, harmonious, blissful marriage. And there's no doubt about it. But like the brother was saying, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong that the divorce rate in the United States right now is at 54%? And that includes Muslims, right? We're not immune to this statistic. And so, inshallah today, we're going to talk about ways to prevent that from happening, inshallah. And we're going to talk about the five practical elements to a happy, harmonious relationship. So, bismillah. Number one, number one is to understand that our relationship with our spouse and our relationship with everyone in our life, 
By the way, these practical tips that we're going to talk about today, they will not only improve your relationship with your spouse, but they'll also improve your relationship with anyone. They'll improve your relationship with your children. They'll improve your relationship with your parents, with your siblings. So applying these principles are very universal. So number one, understanding that our relationships with each other So our relationships are acts of worship. Every relationship that we have is an act of worship, especially our relationship with our spouse. <coughs> Mary, in of itself, is an act of worship. How do we know that? Because the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that when a person gets married, they've completed half of their being. And they should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regard to their other half. Okay? Now, how else do we know that marriage and our interaction with our spouse is an act of worship? Can anyone think of an example? No? So are you guys going to be that proud? I shouldn't ask questions. Let me know from now. No, I'm serious. Bringing into the world believing children. Bringing into the world believing children. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you. You know, I was just in Denmark a few days ago, and when the sisters picked, picked me up from the airport, they wanted to take me out to eat, and so they were all sitting, and I'm very interactive when I speak, and so I'm talking to them, and so I asked them, I was like, I've never been to Denmark before. How are Danish sisters? Because it was going to be a sisters-only program. And they're like, Sister Dunya, Danish sisters, we are so shy. And we don't answer questions, and if you make a joke, we won't laugh. And I'm like, really? Come on, don't do this to me. But you know what? I had some hope because I was a traveler and I made dua that they would be, you know, interactive and they would laugh at my joke. So uh, I started the whole conference off with a joke and they all laughed and I looked at those sisters. I was like, you guys lied to me. Look at them, they're laughing. And they actually answered every single question that I threw at them. So, inshallah, I hope that you guys will be the same so that it can be a little interactive and fun, inshallah. So, act of worship. How else? So, how can you really define an act of worship? Simply. Something that you're rewarded for, right? So, an act of worship could be anything that you get reward for doing. Reward from Allah, right? Well, the Prophet وسلم, said that when you're intimate with your spouse, you get a reward. The Sahaba were very confused, right? So marriage is an act of worship. And everything that we do with our spouse is an act of worship. And you know what happens um, when we start viewing our relationships like that? Like akhirah bank accounts, where every time we do something, we're getting rewarded and it's getting saved for us in the akhirah. Our relationships are transformed. Why? Because when we're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not expecting reciprocation, we're not, uh, accept uh, we're not expecting them to thank us, we're expecting our reward from whom? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, guess what happens? Are sad when you do something because you will never regret doing something for the sake of Allah, right? Did you ever regret giving the sadaqah? Ever. Did you ever say, I wish I could take it back? Why? Because you did it for Allah. So when you when you have that mindset, when you're dealing with your spouse, you're never gonna regret doing something nice for them. Why? Because you were doing it for Allah. Because you know you already got your reward, right? Even in the Quran, what does Allah subhanahu wa say? Innama nufa'imakum li wajhillah la nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. We feed you for the sake of Allah. We do not want from you any type of thanks, and we don't want you to pay us back. So when you are, are in a relationship, and you are acting, and you are doing everything for the sake of Allah, you're never disappointed. Okay, so understanding that. And so when I conduct marriage therapy, I find that the couple 
really makes a breakthrough when they embrace this concept of loving each other for the sake of Allah and looking at their relationship as an act of worship. While we're talking about acts of worship and our relationships as being as such, I wanted to quickly mention love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does anybody know anything about love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You guys are going to go back to that crowd. Okay, I'll answer that question myself. So love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest, the purest type of love. It's so great that on the Day of Judgment, the prophets and the martyrs will be envious of those who love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, for those who love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be on seats of light on the Day of Judgment. And they will be in such a high status that the prophets and the martyrs will be envious of them. In another riwayah, the Prophet Sallallahu when he was describing this, he was looking up so high and pointing up high that his upper garment fell off of his shoulders. Because he was describing how high these people's status are in the Day of Judgment. So loving your spouse, loving your children, loving your parents, loving anyone in your life for the sake of Allah. Because that in and of itself will be an act of worship 24 hours a day. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ also said, Verily, the strongest part of faith is that you love for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, A servant does not love another servant for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that Allah will honor that person. Now, when we look at a relationship as an act of worship, every time we do something, we're seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a beautiful hadith, it's probably one of my favorite hadith, where the Prophet sallallahu said, the most beloved actions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? What do you think it's going to be? Hmm? Loving someone for the sake of Allah? Good answer. Anyone else? The Prophet Sallallahu in this particular hadith said, the most beloved deed, the most beloved action to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la is making another Muslim happy. So imagine every time you made your spouse happy, you're in your mind thinking, I'm doing the most beloved action, the most beloved deed to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la. How are you going to feel about doing that? You're going to feel awesome, right? You're going to feel super happy. Because guess what? Helping someone with their need, right? In another hadith the Prophet said, helping someone with their need is better than spending a whole month in the masjid of the Prophet making i'tikaf, meaning praying, making dhikr, reciting Quran 24 hours a day for 30 days. So imagine next time you you help your spouse and you're thinking of it as an act of worship. How happy are you going to be that you're helping your spouse? Extremely happy, right? So imagine how just doing that is going to change the the dynamics of your relationship. So that was number one, which was look at your relationship as an act of worship. And inshallah, I have some exercises for you guys, if you guys would like to participate. Um, And so number one is a question that you can ask yourself. If you have a piece of paper and a pen, you could jot down the answers. I'm going to give you guys a few moments. How can your relationship with your spouse be a means of attaining Jannah? Number two, what acts of worship can you start doing with your spouse? And number three is the beautiful du'a in Surah Al-Furqan, where Allah subhanahu wa says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا فُرَّةَ آيُنْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا So number three is really thinking about this du'a, memorizing this du'a and understanding that in order for us to have harmonious, beautiful relationships, we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what did we say? 
The hearts are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, um, it looks like y'all really don't want to do these exercises, so I'm going to go on to number two. <laughs> so, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm used to teaching workshops that are very interactive um, with workbooks and worksheets and you know, it's a lot of fun, and so I'm not really used to this type of setting, but inshallah, I, I think, um, inshallah, we can, inshallah, have a good time tonight. Bismillah. So number two, commit. Okay. So what does that mean to commit? It's so easy to fall in love. If everybody thinks about the first time they met their spouse, that first week, that first month, love came so easily, so naturally. But it takes work to stay in love. It takes commitment. And one of the biggest misunderstandings with relationships, especially marriage, is that it comes naturally. You know, it just happens. Why? Because in the beginning, it's really easy because there's so many hormones, it's exciting, but we really need to work to nurture that love. And so the, one of the keys to a beautiful, harmonious relationship is to actually put in a lot of work and a lot of effort to commit to that relationship. Now, we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He is the one who places the love and mercy between the hearts, right? The ayah from Surah al -Rum, The ayah that's on almost every single wedding card. So the analogy that I like to use is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plants that beautiful seed of mawadza and rahma between the hearts when two people get married. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of says, and it's up to you both to nurture that seed to take care of it, to protect it from any type of harm, to make sure it gets the sunlight and the water and the nutrients it needs, to protect it from predators, to protect it from the elements, to allow it to grow. grows, and then what happens? He has a lot of crops, right? He reaps what? What he sows. And the same is true. The more work you put into your relationship, the better it will be. And this is scientifically proven. There are so many studies. And inshallah, we're going to talk about that right now. So there are so many studies um, in which researchers have found that the more work and the more effort, and the more you commit to a relationship, the better it will be. And so, inshallah, today I'm going to give you some tools so that you can put them into practice and get that relationship that you always wanted. But you have to keep in mind that it's like I'm going to be a doctor today. And I'm going to write the, prescri the prescription for you, and I'm going to give it to you. But it's really up to you all and what you do after that, right? You could either say, oh, well, this doctor doesn't know what she's talking about and crumple it up and throw it away, or you can put it in your purse and kind of forget about it, right? Or you can actually go to the pharmacy, give it to them, get your medicine, follow the directions, and take it accordingly. So, bismillah. 
So a big part of commitment and a big part of putting effort and work into our relationships is time. So research suggests that happily married couples spend at least five hours a week together. And so if you think about it, the Prophet وسلم, every day would go to each one of his wives and spend some time with them, right? Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet وسلم, as what? Uswatan Hassan, right? He sent him as a guide for us, as a as a beautiful, perfect example for us to follow. And so he would spend time with his spouses, right? And so a lot of times, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, um, I was in a counseling session, and the sister was like, yeah, and so I asked some questions, and I was like, what about this, what about... She said, yeah, no, we don't have time for that. Really? You don't have time for that? You don't have time to put into your relationship? So everything else in your life is more important than the relationship between you and your spouse? Then your children growing up to watch their parents being cold and distant and learning those relationship habits and then it becoming a never-ending cycle. So we have to give our spouses time. Five hours a week. So couples whose marriages improve do the following. Number one, they pay special attention in the morning when they park when the husband or the wife goes to work, they spend some time beforehand, even if it's just five minutes, discussing what they're going to be doing in their day. Like, hey, having a cup of coffee in the morning and saying, you know what, honey, today I had a meeting. I'm so stressed out about it. You know, my boss, he's really, you know, asking me to do so much. Or the wife saying, you know what, honey, today the kids, they have soccer practice. And you know how much I hate taking up soccer practice. Or... Spending five minutes before you part your ways in the morning, just connecting on an emotional level, right? Number two, reunions. So when you guys meet up again at the end of the day, when the husband or the wife comes home from work, that, those first 10 minutes are so critical. Did you know that the Prophet used to do the first thing when he got home? Anyone? I'm going to keep trying because I have faith in you guys. I know you guys are going to end up. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mel. God bless you. The first thing he used to do, he used to stand outside the door, use his swag, and when he would come in at Isha Rabbi has says, the first thing he would do is he would kiss me. SubhanAllah. And studies and research suggest that a six-second kiss when you come home, can do wonders on your relationship, subhanAllah. Right? And he taught us the perfect example. So it's so important that when you reconnect, it's not automatic stress, like, oh my God, this is what happened today, the kids did this. It's more like, hey, how are you? Hug, kiss, be affectionate, right? First five minutes, and then inshallah, later on, you can talk about those stressful things. Have hikmah, have wisdom, right? Who's, who's going to want to see their spouse as, uh, you know, example I give? Imagine if you, every time you cook, you burnt yourself, you felt pain. Would you want to cook? Or every time you stuck your laptop in the charger, you got electrocuted, you got zapped a little bit. Would you want to do it anymore? No, right? And so the same is true with our relationships. And so what else we have? What else do we have to do? We have to schedule time, alone time, for the spouses. You know what happens when we get married, especially for the sisters? We forget about ourselves. So we put everything else as a priority, and we forget about ourselves, and then we forget about our relationships, and that's true for the brothers as well. Once we become parents, what happens? We forget that we're husband and wife, right? So we have to remind ourselves. Do you guys remember the story of uh, Salman al-Farisi when he visited Abu Darda? And when he walked in and he noticed that Abu Darda's wife was like sad 
and she looked like she didn't really take care of herself. And then when food was put to eat, I believe that that told Sinran Fasi, no, I'm fasting. And then at night, when Sinran Fasi went to sleep, Abu Dhabda was like, no, I'm going to stay up and pray. And Abu Dhabda said, no, no, you got to sleep. And so when they went to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they told him what happened, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ وَلِزَوْجِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقْ your own soul, yourself, has a right upon you. Take care of yourself. Your spouse has a right upon you. Give your spouse quality time. And your Rabb, your Lord, has a right upon you. And give each one their due rights. So when we become parents, we can't forget that we were husband and wife, right? We can't forget that our spouse has a right upon us. And so we have to make time for our spouses. Schedule date nights. Prioritize your relationship. Because guess what? Happy couples prioritize their relationships. They prioritize their relationships above everything else. Right? Because guess what? In the end of the day, what do you have? Your spouse. Your children are going to grow up and what are they going to do? They're going to get married and they're going to leave. You know what usually happens? Couples don't spend time together when their children are going up. And then they, what happens? They end up drifting and drifting and drifting and drifting. And their kids go to college and get married. And they're alone in the house and they're living like roommates. Do you know why that happens? It's because they didn't take the time to connect. So they drifted and drifted and drifted and drifted. And then one day they realized that they're sleeping in separate rooms, that they don't even know the person that they're married to anymore. And that's really unfortunate, right? So schedule time no matter what. Weekly date nights, even if it's just for an hour, where the kids are with someone else. You put the kids to bed, you bring a babysitter, you have your mother take care of them. It's so important to spend quality time. And research suggests five hours a week. Right? Five hours a week. So you could spread that out. Maybe 30 minutes a day. And then one day a week, you have your date night. Where it's only you and your spouse. And you know, a lot of people think this is really like elementary. Like, we don't need you to tell us to go on dates with our spouse. But think about it. When was the last time you went on a date with your spouse? Alone. Without the kids. When was the last time you planned something different, something fun, something out of the ordinary? It takes work, yes. You have to sit there and think of something creative, but guess what? It'll pay off. Inshallah Do you know what's very interesting? Research suggests that working briefly on your marriage every day will do more for your health then exercise. SubhanAllah. Isn't that amazing? So a lot of people, they work out why? And they eat healthy why? For their health, right? Because they want to live longer. They don't want to have infectious diseases. But the research actually suggests if you spend that time working on your relationship, you'll be healthier. And you know, people who are in unhappy relationships are actually more prone to infectious diseases more prone to infectious diseases. So I, I read one study where people who were in ha unhappy marriages, they, they're actually, their, uh, their lifespan was shorter. Their lifespan was shorter, subhanAllah, than people who were in happy marriages, happy relationships. So when we do spend time with our spouse, we have to give them our undivided attention. Right? You can't be saying, okay, I'm going to spend those 10 minutes with my wife in the morning having coffee while your laptop is open or while you're going through Facebook, right? So undivided attention. So we talked about prioritizing your relationship, scheduling date nights, coffee and tea. And we have to remember, love is not what we say. Love is what we do, right? 
There's a beautiful ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Sallallahu say, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhibbukum Allah. If you really love Allah, then do what? or tea, or maybe it could be that um, every day when you come home from work, you want to spend 10 minutes of non-stressful talk, where we don't talk about the kids, we don't talk about stress, but we have just light-hearted talks, just for 10 minutes, or maybe we want to have dinner every night together. And remember, we have to express our wants and our needs to our spouse in a gentle way. And inshallah, that's going to be our, our next topic, inshallah. The next exercise. For the next week, try to pay special attention to when you wake up. Right? When we wake up, that's a perfect and a beautiful moment to connect. Even if you just spend five minutes just in bed talking. Do you know what the Prophet used to do in the morning after Fajr? He would ask Aisha if she had any dreams that night. And they would talk about it. So just spending five minutes of intimate conversation. Number two, when you're partying, right? In the morning when your spouse is leaving, a six second hug. Number three is your reunion, when your spouse meets again after a long day, a kiss. And this is very important. The ending of your day, giving closure to your day, it's so important that spouses go to bed together, go to sleep together. And a lot of uh, couples complain that one spouse will go to sleep and the other one will stay up working or watching movies. And so it's really, really important to, to go to bed together at the end of the night and to end the day on a positive note. So talk about something positive before you go to sleep. And if you really, really have to go do something, getting permission from your spouse. What do I mean? So one day the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to do that one more time because I feel like you guys are falling asleep. So one day the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a bless you and elevate your status. I mean, Rabbi was sleeping with Aisha radiallahu anha. And she said, I love being close to the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she was kind of tucked into the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were laying down. And then after some time, he was kind of waiting for her to fall asleep, but she didn't. So after some time, he said, May I ask you for something? And she said, of course, Ya Rasulullah. And he said, will you give me permission to pray to my Lord? And she said, I love your nearness. I love being close to you, but I prefer your desire over mine. So go ahead. So look at how beautiful that is. So yes, I'm not going to say that our lives are so perfect and we don't have so much work that we have to do and that every night we can just you know go to sleep together. But if you have something that you have to do, spend five minutes with your spouse and then ask them, you know, my love, John, Habibdi, whatever you call your spouse, you know, I really have, you know, a presentation that I have to do and it has to be done before the morning. Is it okay? if I just go work for a half an hour. And you know, why don't you just go to sleep and inshallah in the morning when you wake up, we'll talk about that. Look how, like, isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that sound so simple? Why don't we do these things? 
Like, why don't they sound so simple, right? So simple, just a few words that make massive difference. But I realize it's because we don't want to commit, we don't want to put that effort in. And it's really unfortunate, right? It's really unfortunate that we feel so entitled that we think that everything will just work out and I don't have to work, I don't have to do anything, right? And so inshallah, we're going to take a five minute break. And inshallah, when we come back, we're going to talk about the next three secrets to um, lasting love, inshallah ta'ala. So inshallah, I'm going to give you guys a five minute break and inshallah, we'll resume in exactly five minutes to that love later. Just a reminder, there is a box of index cards going coming around where uh, if you can write your questions. So uh, Sister Junia will be reviewing them uh, when we break for Isha in 35 minutes here, and then we'll uh, be coming back. Uh, so we will have Q&A after Isha, Isha, so that's not fair. Okay. Okay, so does anybody remember the first two secrets? Worship. Good job. And number two? Commit. Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you. So number three is connect. Now to connect is to express love. And how can you express love? One of the ways is through communication, and that, inshallah, is what we are going to talk about right now. And the majority of people who are truly suffering in their marriages are suffering because of the lack of the tools to co uh, effectively communicate. And so effective communication techniques are one of the most important life skills that we can acquire. It enables us to better understand and connect with our loved ones. And so, the art of communication can be best deduced from a study of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet ﷺ. We learn from the beautiful tradition of our Prophet ﷺ that he was the most proficient in dealing with others, especially with his outstanding communication skills and his perfect manners. 
And communication is one of the most important aspects to a healthy relationship. And researchers agree that open, clear, and frequent communication is the foundation for a strong, healthy, harmonious relationship. And so, inshallah, I'd like to share with you five communication skills that are derived from the Qur'an, Sunnah, and the latest scientific research. So, bismillah, number one skill for communication is wisdom, is to have wisdom. And to understand that we are all different, and we have different levels of understanding, different levels of intellect, and the way that the Prophet ﷺ spoke to, for example, a Bedouin was not the same way he spoke to his wives, was not the same way he spoke to Abu Bakr, who was not the same way he spoke to the Mushrikeen of Quraysh or the Jews of Medina. And we have to understand that, that we can't speak to our spouse the same way we speak to our boss. Right? And so... Having wisdom to know what to say, when to say, and how to say it. And to have that skill of speaking with our spouse. And to think before speaking and to pick the best, most appropriate, most loving and compassionate words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and tell my servants to say that which is best. Indeed, shaitan induces among them. Indeed, shaitan is ever to mankind a clear enemy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to always say what's best. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, He who truly believes in Allah in the last day should speak a good word or remain silent. And so it's so important to always choose the best possible words. And you know, a lot of people, they don't really think before they speak, it's very unfortunate. Um, but the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us and he warned us about not thinking before we speak, because in the hadith, he said a person will say a word without thinking about it, and it will displease Allah subhanahu wa and will throw them into the pits of the hellfire for 70 years. And so it's so important to think before we speak. I posted a video on my Facebook a, a bit, about a week ago. I saw this video. It was a really, really good video. It was about a father who noticed that his son had anger issues. And when he was angry, he would say things that he would later regret. So he gave him a bag of nails and a hammer. And he told him, every time you're angry and you say a bad word, I want you to take a nail, go outside to our fence and then hammer the nail into the fence. And so after about a week, he realized that he's getting angry a lot because he sees all the nails in the fence, and he realizes he's getting really tired from hitting these nails into the fence. And so little by little, he started controlling his anger and controlling his tongue and not speaking while he's angry and not saying things that he'll later regret. And then he finally went to his father and he's like, I'm so happy, you know, I'm not saying anything out of anger anymore. I'm not saying things that I'm going to regret. And so the father took the boy out to the backyard and he said, oh, okay, so why don't you take out all of the nails that you hit into the fence? And so he sat there and he removed all the nails and he saw all the holes that he made in the fence. And the father said, is the fence the same? And the boy said, no, it has so many holes in it. And then the father said, will the fence ever be the same again? And he said, no. And he taught him a really great lesson, right? That I took a class called Makarim and Akhlaq, and our sheikh told us an example that I'll never forget. He said, our mouths are like guns. Our words are like bullets. Once they come out, what happens? When you shoot a gun and a bullet comes out, what happens? Can you ever take it back? Even if it's a split second after you shoot, can you say, wait, no, no, don't shoot? You can't do that, right? And it will always, what, what will the bullet always do? It will hit something. And does the bullet always hit the target? 
No, right? So we have to be very careful with our words because once we hurt someone with our words, it's very hard to do what? To take it back. And so having the wisdom. Another aspect of wisdom is to be clear about what you're saying because no one's a mind reader. And one of the things that I see in couples therapy is that spouses expect their spouse to read their minds and to just know what they're thinking or they're feeling and that's not fair. Right? Because no one's a mind reader. And the sisters are laughing because it's especially prevalent in sisters. Um, he should just know. Okay, sister, how will he know? <laughs> Tell me, please. And she's like, I don't know, but he should just know. I'm like, no, he shouldn't. And so, be clear. No one's uh, a mind reader. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O oh, you who have believed, fear Allah, and speak clear words straight to the point. So speak clearly. Um, the Prophet used to use visuals, analogies. He used to make sure that his message was understood. He would repeat and rephrase, right? You know, in a hadith where he'd say stuff three times, or there was hadiths where he would draw in the sand that we know, or he would use his hands, or he would point, for example, at the moon and say, on the day of judgment, the believers will see Allah the same way that you're seeing this full moon. So be clear and use different speaking <coughs> styles because people understand in different ways. Some people understand with words, some people understand more with visuals. And so be clear about what you want. And always be gentle in the way you say it. And always choose the right time. You know there's a cliche that says there's a time and place for everything and communication is no different. Right? You don't want to talk to your spouses about something really important when they're stressed out or when they're hungry or when they just walk in from a long day at work. So you want to choose a good time to speak to your spouse about things. And this is so important. If you're talking and it's getting heated, take a break. Please take a break. Because uh, studies suggest that couples who, when they feel like the argument, the, the discussion is getting heated, take a 20-minute break. They're more likely to not have conflict. So let's say you're talking to your spouse about something and you realize that you both are getting very overwhelmed or even one of you is getting overwhelmed. Usually, it's, I'm sorry sisters, usually it's the husband who's getting overwhelmed and he's being really quiet and his heart rate is elevating and usually it's the sister who just got to keep going. Um, please sisters, understand that really at that moment, physiologically, your husband is flooded. His brain is flooded, his heart rate is up, he's probably sweating, and so he probably won't be able to think clearly. And so the best thing that you can do is to take a break, to agree, hey, you know what, let's take a break. Um, let's both just, I don't know, read a book, watch some TV, go outside for a walk, whatever, and inshallah we'll talk about this after 20 minutes. Um, so if you need a break, take a break. That's a part of wisdom. Number two, Number two for communication, soft startups. What's a soft startup? Our beautiful being is so perfect. Um, what are we what are we told to do when we meet a Muslim? Say Samalaika, right? That's the perfect soft startup. Imagine the first thing you say is assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What does that mean? Peace and blessings be upon you. You know what it means? It means between you and I there's peace. Starting off really soft. What else are we um, really encouraged to do with mahrams and people of the same gender? <laughs> shake their hand, right? I needed to clarify that. I shake their hand, right? So touch. What else? Smile. The Prophet said, smiling in the face of your brother or sister is what? Charity. The Sahaba said, We've never seen the Prophet Sallallahu except that he was <coughs> smiling. So start off with kind words, something very positive. The Prophet Sallallahu said, a good word is charity. Start off with a good word. Luqman, before advising his son, what did he say? Ya Bunay. Oh my dear beloved son, Ibrahim Alayhi before speaking to his Catholic father who was actually making the idols, what does he call him? 
Yeah, Abati. Do you know what Yeah, Abati is? It's the most loving, gentle, kind form of calling your father. Even, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he spoke to Musa alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam was going to go speak to who? Firaun, the greatest tyrant of all time. What did Allah say to Musa alayhi salam? And speak to him in a gentle manner, right? And so, what else is a soft startup? Praise. Do you guys know the etiquettes of du'a when we talk to our Lord? How should we start our du'a? Anybody know what the Prophet Hassan advised us to do? Start with praise, right? Thana, praise. So praise. So look at this. It's a beautiful example from the life of the Prophet Hassan. When the Prophet Hassan wanted to advise a young man, Abdullah, do you know what he did? He said, what an excellent man Abdullah is. And then he gave him advice. Express love and physical touch. Mu'adh anhu says that one day the Prophet وسلم, came to me and took me by the hand and put his arm around me and said, Oh Mu'adh, I swear by Allah, I love you. Imagine starting off your conversation with your spouse. Touching them physically, and there's so many studies and there's so much research that shows the importance of physical touch. And in one study that I recently read, um, physical touch can be as effective as antidepressant medication. So imagine the prof imagine if you're speaking to your spouse and before you start talking to them, you touch them and you say, I swear by Allah, I love you. And then you start talking. What would that conversation be like? Pretty good, right? SubhanAllah. So that's how the Prophet Sallallahu communicated. What else did he do? Number three for communication, to listen actively. To listen actively. Listen with your eyes and your ears and your mind and your heart. Give your full undivided attention, no distractions, and yes, I mean your cell phone. You know, I saw this picture on psychology today and loved it. It was so true. It was a picture of a man and a woman laying in bed, and then right in between them was a huge uh, phone. And I was like, how, how true is that? Come on, we all know it. What do we do when we get into bed? Sitting there like, oh, I got some links on my Facebook post. Checking Snapchat or something. When the Prophet Sallallahu was walking away, was walking, and someone would call his name, do you know what he would do? He would stop, turn around, give his full attention to that person who called his name, and speak to them, giving them his full attention. So when we're communicating, we need to give our spouses and our loved ones our full attention. We have to specially, specially make sure, especially with our spouses, eye contact, nonverbal cues like head nodding. Um, use bridge phrases such as, really? Oh, That's really interesting. And then what happened? Because if you're not doing that, you know what your spouse is thinking? They're not listening. So did you ever did you ever tell your husband, love, hey? Why? It's because they're not giving you those nonverbal cues. So you need to say those things. Oh, and how did that make you feel? Oh wow, subhanallah. Is there anything I can do to help? And so we have to listen actively without thinking about a comeback. A lot of times in counseling, I'm looking and I'm reading body language, and when one spouse is talking, the other one's just thinking about how they're going to respond and like attack. And so that's not active listening, because guess what happens when you're doing that? You're not hearing what the other person's trying to say. And so you miss completely everything that they're saying, and you just start attacking, right? And so... Take the time to listen and absorb what your spouse is saying to better understand their perspective and their point of view. Show empathy and validation. When your spouse is talking to you and they're hurt, show empathy. When they're asking you questions, answer and validate their feelings. 
You know, there's a, a very long hadith. It's called the Hadith of Um Zara. Did you guys ever hear about this hadith? Anyone? Hadith of Um Zara? SubhanAllah. Okay. Awesome. So Aisha radiallahu anha came to the Prophet وسلم, and she said to him, Ya Rasulullah, and I want you to imagine, who is the Prophet وسلم? The last and final messenger, he had the big, great amana of um, spreading the last and final message from God, right? Was he a busy man? Extremely busy, right? He was not only trying to teach the deen, this new religion, these new concepts that these these most these people didn't really hear of before because the Mushrikeen of Quraysh didn't really have this sense of religion because they weren't Christians or Jews. But what else? He was trying to survive. They were being attacked from every direction. He had multiple what? Assassination attempts. They would go into battle and it would be 3,000 Muslims versus like 100,000 Mushrikeen, right? He was trying to build a new um, a new community in Medina. He had so many responsibilities. He was the busiest man on earth. Can you agree? Perfect. So this busy man, his wife, Aisha, comes to him and says, you know, one time I was sitting with these 11 women, and each woman was telling us their whole life story about how them and their spouses were. And she starts telling the Prophet also about 11 women and their relationships with their husband. This hadith is so long. Like, I couldn't even read through it at all. And at the end, she finishes her long story. And you know what the Prophet also does? He looks at her and he says, Oh, Aisha, I like you. I, I mean, I like Abu Zarek to Im Zarek to you, except that I'll never divorce you the way Abu Zarek divorced Um Zarek. So, what does that mean? He was listening and understood and comprehended this whole entire story. And what did he do? He showed empathy, right? Because her talking about that, what does that mean? She's a little worried, right? Because Abu Zara and Um Zara loved each other so much, but then something happened, and one day Abu Zara just divorced Um Zara. So she's a little worried. So what did he do? He comforted her, showed her empathy, was actively listening, repeated what um, was said to, to her so that she knew that he heard everything that she said. Can someone do me a favor and just touch that so that our slides can come back? Thank you. So actively listening, express your understanding, and validate your spouse's emotions. Never make them feel like what they're feeling is unimportant. And let your spouse know that you understand what they're saying, even if you don't necessarily agree with them. You respect and understand what they're saying, even if you don't necessarily agree with them. Did you know that a lot of people fall in love with someone who will just give them their, their heart and their ear? A lot of people mistake someone listening to them for love. Do you know a lot of people actually fall in love with their therapists? <laughs> you guys are laughing, but it's actually very true. Do you know why? Because... We can't differentiate between that feeling of love and that feeling of someone giving us that time, that attention, listening, and understanding us. One of the greatest human needs that we have, we have is to feel understood. And how can you feel understood? Someone takes the time out to listen, right? And so listening is so important. Number four, play, pay close attention to your tone your volume, your body language, your facial expression, no eye rolling, and no facial dis um, facial expressions of disgust or contempt. So there's a difference of opinion between you know researchers on how much of communication is verbal versus nonverbal. So there are some studies that suggest that only seven percent 
of your communication is what you say, and 93% is how you say it in your body language, and others vary up to 35% of what you say, it's 65% of how you say it. But everyone agrees that nonverbal communication is a huge overlooked part of communication. And so number one, pay attention to your volume and tone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and be moderate in your pace and lower your voice. Indeed, the most harshest of sounds is the voice of a donkey. So don't scream and yell like a donkey, basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here. You don't have to raise your voice to get your point across. Do you know what happens when you start raising your voice? Your spouse turns you out. Start building your voice, right? And so, speak gently, use kind words, be mindful of your tone. And we talked about this, right? What did Allah subhanahu wa tell Musa said to say to the greatest tyrant of all time, the guy who was a baby killer, he murdered hundreds and hundreds of thousands of babies. He's the one who said, I am your Lord most high. And what did Allah say? Speak to him in a gentle tone, right? Be very mindful of your facial expressions. Can anyone tell me where in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of this? I will make so much da'at for you. Come on, someone just say something. Huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you all the goodness in this life and all the goodness in the hereafter and make you happy in this life and happy in the hereafter and make he subhanahu wa ta'ala remove all of your stresses and, and give you relief and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enter you into Jannah with the Dawsh of the Prophet. So one day the Prophet was speaking to Quraysh, trying to make da'wah. And a blind man who cannot see facial expressions came to him. And the Prophet just made a facial expression that this blind man couldn't even see. So he wasn't very mindful of his facial expression. And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? Allah taught the Prophet and taught us to be very mindful of our facial expressions, even if you're talking to someone who can't see them. So the Prophet made a facial expression, I don't know what facial expression, and Allah said, hey, don't do that. Why? How much does it hurt when you, I think this is more of a sister's thing, but brothers, how much does it hurt when you're talking to your wife and she makes a mean looking face as she rolls her eyes at you? It hurts a lot, right? Sisters are laughing because they know it's true. So be very mindful of your facial expression. Number five of communication is always be respectful and encouraging. Never be disrespectful or criticized. Avoid using words like you always or you never. Don't ever attack the person's personality or character. And don't forget and dismiss all the good that someone did, especially during a disagreement. Um, so criticism brings up a barrier and yields very ineffective. A lot of times we think that when we criticize our spouse that that will make them change. Right? When we show them all of their defects and we tell them all of these bad things about them, we expect them to say something like, thank you, honey. You know, thank you for pointing out all of the horrible things about me. You know, can we meet up tomorrow? Can you tell me more? That's not how it works, right? Nobody likes to be criticized. No one likes to be criticized. And the Prophet Sassan did not criticize people. Even when people did something wrong, you know what he would do? He would go on the number and he would say, you know, I heard that there are people who are doing such and such. Don't do it. He never even pointed the finger at the person who was doing it to make them feel bad. So don't criticize your spouse. Um, you know, researchers discovered that they can predict the likelihood of a couple divorcing by observing them for just the first three minutes of conflict discussion. And the couples who divorced started their discussion with negativity and lots of bad facial expressions, and they used criticism. And so we don't want to use criticism. When we want to talk about something, we want to use I statements, right? I feel like we don't want to criticize or attack. And so that's connect. Our next key to 
don't like cream. I think because it turned off for a second, the projector. Yeah, thank you. So the next secret to lasting love is discover. Next one, please. Because I love hair. Is to ask and to, to learn about your spouse. To learn about their dreams and their aspirations in life. You know, the Prophet saw some he was so perfect. You know what Aisha's mom has said? She said that one time the Prophet said to me, Oh, Aisha, I know when you're upset at me. And I know when you're happy with me. And she said, Really? Like, how could you know? I don't do anything. And he saw some said, When you're upset at me, you swear by the Lord of Ibrahim. And when you're pleased with me, you swear by the Lord of Muhammad. So we have to know our spouses. We have to... A happy couples are familiar with their spouse's world. We have to know what our spouse's dreams and aspirations and goals are. We have to know what our spouse's favorite color is, which might change every few years, or their favorite food, or who their best friends are, or what they like to do in their free time. We have to know things about their childhood. We have to know things about their day, what their day was like. Are they stressed out about a certain co-worker? What is their boss like, right? So it's so important to be familiar with your spouse's world, with your spouse's is mind and heart. And so there's a lot of exercises that we can do, inshallah, and maybe I can share them with you. I'm just going to end because I have two more minutes, and I have one more thing that I wanted to share with you. Can you do that, please? Uh, one more. And that's number five, which is a tune. A tune is to look for the positive in your spouse. So happy couples who stay married, when they look at their spouse, they think of the positive. And the Prophet Sallallahu he taught us this. He said, a believer should not despise a believing woman. If he finds something in, his in her character that he dislikes, he focuses and he looks at the characteristics that he's pleased with. So we should always focus on the positive. Because Shaitan wants us to focus on the negative and to exaggerate it. But happy couples focus on the positive. They think of the good times. They think, oh, you know, mashallah, you know, my wife, mashallah, she's such a good cook. Or mashallah, my husband, he works so hard to provide for us. They think about the positive and they appreciate it. And they don't just appreciate it because a lot of times people say, well, you know, he knows I appreciate him. No, right? We said people are not mind readers. We have to do what? We have to verbalize our appreciation. The Prophet said, if someone does something for you, you should do what? Say Jazakumullah Khairan. Another hadith, the Prophet said, if someone does something for you, you should try to repay them. Do something good back to them. And if you can't, keep making dua for them until you feel like your dua was enough to repay them for what they did. So showing appreciation to your spouse is one of the greatest things that you can do in your marriage. Um, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to bless our families and to bless our marriages. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove any ill feelings that we may be having between us and our spouses. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me if I said anything that was wrong because that's truly from my own self and shaitan. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the same way that he gathered us here to gather us in the highest level of Jannah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Jazakallah Khairan for your patience with me, inshallah. And if you'd like to hear more and learn more, inshallah, tomorrow I will be doing a workshop here. I know it's been um, advertised as it's for single couples, but I promise you that everyone and anyone can benefit from the information that we're going to discuss, inshallah. And Jazakallah Khairan, if you have any questions, you have the index cards, and inshallah, after Salah, I'll be answering those questions. Jazakallah Khairan. I do the hardest one first. What do you guys think? Should I do the hardest one first? Okay.
So the hardest question that I receive is why do husbands cheat? Oh, okay, so first and foremost, first and foremost, there's nothing, there's nothing that can justify this. There's nothing husband or wife. And honestly, we live in a day and age where I'm going to be completely honest, the infidelity rates amongst women are also very high. So it's not the men anymore, it's not just the husband, so I'm going to be more general. And so there's nothing, nothing, nothing that justifies this type of behavior. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive and protect us all. So there have actually been a lot of studies and there's been a lot of research done on why do people um, look outside of their marriage. And one of the studies suggests is that they're not, obviously they're not being fulfilled in their marriage. And that doesn't mean that the blame is on this other stuff. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that, and I, I need to preface that, that we're not saying by saying this reason that we're blaming the other spouse, not at all. But I was asked a question, and I'm just going to give you the research and what studies have shown. So the research suggests that uh, many... Um, people who look outside of their marriage do so because they're not fulfilled inside of their marriage. And inshallah, this is something that we're going to talk about tomorrow. We're going to talk about what are our emotional needs. And these needs that we have are just like food and water. Right? Just like food and water. You know, um, one time I read a study about why do people cheat with people who are not as attractive as their actual spouse. And the research is pretty interesting. It's because when we're hungry emotionally, it's like being hungry physically. If you are starving, you would eat anything in front of you, correct? Even if it was, for example, I'll give you an example. I think hot dogs are disgusting. I watched this documentary on how they were made, right? And I would never eat a hot dog. But if I was starving, would I eat a hot dog? Stay alive. Yes, right? And so basically our emotional needs are just as strong as our, or even if not stronger, as our physical needs of food and water. And so one study suggests it is because um, the spouse isn't fulfilled in their marriage, right? And then there are other studies that say that things like uh, people are looking for variety and people are looking for excitement. And like I said, again, we're not justifying it. But this question is so broad. So if you are a person who... Um, is in a relationship with, with, and your spouse is unfaithful, you can go to counseling and inshallah find out the root cause of it. Because it could be something else, right? Human beings are such interesting beings because we're all so different. Wallahu a'ala. Okay. What do you do when your spouse's defense is not logic, but they shout loudly? First of all, we shouldn't be shouting loudly, right? We already discussed that. Second of all, I read a beautiful quote by Umar anhu where he said that if one of you is like fire, the other one should be water. And it's extremely difficult to be the water. Extremely difficult to be the water. But what I would do is, and I know it's going to be difficult, but I would, I would advise to show empathy to your spouse. Because the reason why they're shouting is because they feel like you don't hear them. You know, there's a lot of times when we speak and the person isn't understanding us and we get very frustrated. Why? Because we feel like they're not hearing us. And when we're not equipped with the right proper tools, the only thing we know to do is what? Scream. Did you ever notice with children, 
when they tell you something and you kind of tell them no, what do they start doing? They start screaming, why? Because they think that you didn't really understand how badly they want it or you didn't understand what exactly they wanted, so they feel like if they shout it, that it'll get your attention, it'll make you understand, but it really has the opposite effect. So first of all, what I would do if I was in a conversation with someone who was screaming, speaking very loudly, I would take a deep breath myself, and I would say, I would have been dead in the shaitan of a dream, and I would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me patience and to give me wisdom to deal with the situation correctly. The second thing that I would do is that I would wait it out for a little bit, and then I would show some empathy. And I would say something like, it looks like you're really frustrated at this situation. Maybe, you know, we can both remember. I and we statements, you don't say you and you don't attack the person because that's just going to make it worse. Maybe we could, we can both calm down, take a five minute break, maybe write out our thoughts and our feelings and then talk about it. Right? You want to be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Respond with that which is Ahsan. Do you know what Ahsan means? From Ahsan? Like the best. Like I want you to imagine when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? When he was ridiculed, when he was cursed at, right? And how did he respond? He responded in a better way. And what does Allah Subhanahu Wa say in that in that section of the Quran. What will happen if you do that? Any kafar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if you do that, maybe the one in which there is hostility with will become a close friend and a companion, right? And so I know it's hard and it's difficult, but at the same time our reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on our what? On our actions and how hard it is, right? So, let me give you an example. If you're an Arab and you're born reading Quran and knowing how to recite Quran and you recite Quran so beautifully, you get one reward, right? But if you don't know any Arabic and when you recite the Quran it's so difficult and it's hard and you make mistakes, what happens? You get double the reward. The same is true with everything else in life. When you're dealing with someone who's very um, hard to deal with versus someone who's dealing with someone is easier to deal with, your reward is greater, right? And so that's what I would do. Another thing that I would do is I would, at a later time, talk to them about it. Because if you know, um, my love, Habibi, John, whatever words you call your spouse, I love talking about things with you, but sometimes, you know, we get heated and we start raising, we start raising our voices and it's really like, it becomes really hard for me to stay in that kind of conversation and it hurts my feelings and then give a solution. Be like, what if the next time we feel like we're going to raise our voices, we take a deep breath and we go make wudu or we go drink some water and we write down our feelings and then we come back. So give a solution, right? Um, so that's how I would deal with this. Wallahu a'ala. Assalamu alaikum. So can the, uh, what can the other spouse do if one spouse is following these principles but the, but the other spouse is not? Again, this is a very difficult situation, right? When you feel like you're doing everything you possibly can and your spouse isn't reciprocating. Um, number one, first and foremost, right, we would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. But number two, maybe your spouse doesn't know. If that's the case that they don't know, maybe saying something like, hey, you know, there's this online class that I heard is awesome that teaches skills about relationships and I love us and I want us to grow and show what if we took it together. It is a really good book. So that 
you can uh, usually it's easier when someone just doesn't know and it's a matter of just educating them but what if the person knows but they it's difficult for them to change or if you don't care to change that's when i would definitely recommend counseling having a mediator because what does the last part of that say he said hakanan Right? To send, to have a mediator mediate between them. And mashallah, tabarakallah, you, your community is very blessed because you guys actually have a lot of Muslim therapists. Like, I was so excited to come here because other communities don't have Muslim therapists in their midst. So, use these resources, right? Um, and so that's what I would do, inshallah ta'ala. How do we balance pleasing our parents and pleasing our spouse? I think one of the hardest situations is when you're put between a rock and a hard place, and this is one of them, right? Where, you know, you, your parents have rights and responsibilities over you, and so does your spouse. And it's really hard to do it, right? But we have to be balanced. And we have to have so much wisdom by giving everyone their due rights and by setting boundaries. One of the things that we were not taught is to have personal boundaries, right? Um, once I had a couple where the uh, husbands brought up the story of Abu Bakr who telling his son to divorce his wife. And people bring up these things, right? Like from the past, or you know, even the example, I don't know if you know the example of Ibrahim when he came and visited his son and told his son to divorce his wife and to marry someone else. We have to understand, that was Ibrahim he was Khalilullah, like, he had revelation, right? He was not you and me. And so when he said something, he said something out of what? Out of knowledge maybe of the unseen, right? And so we can't use those examples for us. And so when, I think, Probably this was a brother who asked this question because usually it's the brothers who have the hardest time. And I think just being really wise about spending time with your mother alone and also spending equal amount of time with your wife alone and expressing, I know a lot of times our mothers, sometimes they cause some issues because there's a few questions here about daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws. And I think that the root of all of this is principle number one. Do you guys remember what it is? Worship. That we're not looking at it as an act of worship. And that we're not remembering the sanctity of a human being. Do you know that there are two types of rights? Hukuk Allah and Hukuk al right? Hukuk, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are like prayer, right? And Hukuk al are the way that we deal with people. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can and will, inshaAllah, forgive any shortcomings between us and Him. But do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive? When we hurt others. So do you know that? Where's my proof, right? You're like, Sister Dunya, what are you talking about? Allah forgives everything. True. But when we transgress upon the rights of others, on the day of judgment, but you know what the Prophet Sassam said? He told the Sahaba, men are worthless. Who's the bankrupt person? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, the bankrupt person is the person who had a lot of wealth, but then they lost it all. And he said, no. The bankrupt person is the person who comes on the day of judgment with a lot of good deeds. They did hajj, they prayed, they used to fast, right? But they hurt people. So they hurt this person with their tongue, with shaitan. So on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that person that they hurt 
And Allah will say, you know, and you have to remember, what, on the Day of Judgment, there will be people who they only need one good deed to go to Jannah. They will run around and go to the prophets, and the prophets will say, nafsi, nafsi. They'll go to their mother, who in this dunya would give them her eyes, and you know what the mother will say? Get away from me. I'm not going to give you not even one hasana. So imagine this person who was hurt in the dunya, when Allah says to them, oh, you know, this person hurt you, but they they had so Would you like that reward? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that. And the Prophet said, and they'll keep giving away their rewards to people that they've heard in the dunya so they have none left. Right? Another hadith that's very interesting is that there was a woman at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu she was sawama sawama. What does that mean? She would fast her days and she would pray all night. And so the Sahaba told the Prophet Hassan about her. They were like, Ya Rasulullah, so this woman, she fasts all day and she prays all night, but she hurts her neighbors with her tongue. She backbites, she curses at them, she says mean things to them. Do you know what the Prophet Hassan said? He had been not. She's in the hellfire. And I said, but Ya Rasulullah, there's another woman who, you know, she just does her bare minimum, she prays her five prayers, and she fasts in Ramadan, but she doesn't hurt her neighbors, she doesn't hurt other people, and the Prophet has not said, she's in Jannah. So we have to remember that. So as mother-in-laws, we have to remember that the way that we deal with our daughter-in-laws, the way that we deal with everyone, we're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as daughter-in-laws, we need to remember that the way we deal with our mother-in-laws is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you know when we recite, what did we recite today? Today's Jummah. What do we recite on Jummah? Surah Kaf, right? Why? Why right? every Friday Surah Kaf? There's so many lessons, but one of the lessons is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes someone from the Day of Judgment when they say, Man had a kitab, la yubadu yusali ratan wa kathiratan illa ashram. What is this book of deeds? There's nothing big or small except that it was accounted for. So we have to remember that everything we do will be held accountable for it. So even that look, do you know what Sa'isha? Do you guys know who Sa'isha Rana is? The most beloved person to the Prophet Sallallahu right? He was once asked, Ya Rasulullah, who's the most beloved person to you? And, and without hesitation he said, Aisha. And the Sahaba is like, no, no, we don't mean that. We mean from the man. And then he said, her father. So this most beloved person to the Prophet Sallallahu once was talking to the Prophet Sallallahu and she just went like this. Meaning, the person that she was talking about was what? Short. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say to him? He said, I swear, Aisha, if we were to take that expression that you just made and put it into the ocean, all of the water in the world would become salty. We wouldn't have any clean, fresh water. SubhanAllah. So we have to remember these things, right? We have to remember that the way we go with our mother-in-laws, our father-in-laws, our daughter-in-laws, are everyone. Allah is watching, and it's a big deal to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us so much that he protects us from physical harm, but he also protects us from emotional pain and torment. And so how do you balance between pleasing our parents and our spouses? Is first and foremost by making your intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and communicating to your parents that, hey, my spouse has a right upon me. Don't you love me? You want me to go to Jannah? Well, the Prophet said that my spouse is my responsibility and that she or he has rights upon me and I need to fulfill them. And that's not taking away from your rights and your responsibilities, but please help me. You know, just open communication, lovingly ask. You know, a lot of times people say, well, no, I never, I never asked, you know, my mom that. I'm like, why not? Tell her. Tell her, you know what, mom? 
I'm really stressed. Why are you stressed? Because I feel like I'm in a between a rock and a hard place, you know. I love you, I love my wife. I want to please you, I want to please my wife, and it's becoming difficult. Help me, help me go to Jannah because you're my Jannah, but she is too. And then work on something. You know, what happened to just basic communication? I love. So that's my advice for this person. Are you guys tired at all? Whenever you guys get to the point where you guys are like, Sister Dunya, we don't want to hear you anymore, just let me know. I won't get offended, I promise. Okay, Bismillah. Okay, so what do you recommend to couples that feel that their marriage has already died? And that they don't feel the same love they first had for one another? So I truly believe love does not die a natural death. And so, I would see why. Why don't you feel the same thing that you thought before? Why do you feel like the love died? What happened? What is it that you both are doing or not doing? And if you need help figuring that out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, anu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun. Ask those who know, if you know not, right? There's nothing wrong with asking for help. Right? The Sahaba constantly came to the Prophet Sallallahu and asked him for counsel and for help. And after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi passed away, they would go to Abu Bakr and then Umar. And so seeking help, right? But some some basic things that we can do to rekindle love are the things that we talked about today. Number one is I would definitely, definitely try to have lots of non-stressful conversations. Like, hey, you know what I was just thinking, honey? Can you tell me about your childhood? What's one of your favorite memories? You know, what was your life like when you were a kid and you were living in Pakistan or whatever? Or hey, you know what? Um, I know I haven't asked you this in a while, but what's your favorite food? Like, we don't know our spouses. But do you know what makes us fall in love? When we feel like someone knows and, love and, and understands us and accepts us. We need to stop trying to change our spouses. Right? Because when you try to change your spouse, what are you telling them? You're not good enough. You're defective. You need to be X, Y, and Z. And is that fair? No. Would you like someone telling you that? No. Did the Prophet say to treat others the way you want to be treated? Yes. So why is it that we're doing to our spouses things that we wouldn't want someone doing to us? And so I would go back and I would see where did this disconnect happen because you're saying here in this question that they don't feel the same love they first had. So that means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely placed that seed. But what happened? You didn't nurture it enough to grow. Do you know what's really cool about seeds? Anybody know anything about seeds? Even if some time has passed, and you didn't take care of that seed, once you start giving it water and sunlight, what happens? It starts growing. So inshallah, give your marriage that water and that sunlight. Nurture your marriage, and inshallah, ask Allah to help you. And be really frank and honest. Be like, you know what? I was at this class about marriage, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I wasn't, you know, I didn't give you attention. I'm sorry that I hurt you so much. And you know what? I want to change. Today I want to change because I know that we had something that was so beautiful. And inshallah, today I want to start working on that. Tell me, how can I do that? And start working on your marriage. Allahu Okay, bismillah. Okay, we said we're not going to answer third question, so that goes out the window. How should a wife react to the topic of a second wife? That's going to go out the window. (laughs) 
okay, so what if I don't want to go out with my husband without my kids? Do you want to read this question? I'm actually really hurt inside a little bit because I'm not sure where it's coming from. If it's because you don't want to be alone with your husband because you don't feel like you'll, or your wife, because you don't feel like you'll know what to do with them, that makes me so sad. Can I share with you guys something that happened about a year ago? I was at a community and I was teaching um, the importance of mental health to youth. And it was time for a question, so I got this one question that made me cry. It was a young boy who said, If I get married, will I be allowed to hug and kiss my wife? Anybody want to know why I cried? Hmm? He never saw his parents hug and kiss. We're all adults here. Can I tell you something? Do you want to know why a lot of our youth don't want to get married or they want to marry non-Muslims? Is because of that. Because they think, well, I've seen my parents, they've been miserable, they've never showed any type of love and attention, so why would I want to get married again? Or they think, oh, that's just a Muslim thing, because in the movies, non-Muslims do that stuff, so I want to marry a non-Muslim. Or there's this other extreme where they start thinking about people of the same gender. That also And so, so you don't want to go out with your spouse? Is it because you don't feel like you'll have a good time? Because you, you know what happens? I'm very observant, that's just how Allah kind of created me, and that's what I was trained to do, right? And so every time I go out to dinner, I kind of scan. And the saddest thing is when I see a Muslim family sitting there, and they're all like this. And I'll look over every few minutes, and I'll notice that they entered, they had dinner, and they exited, and the whole entire family didn't speak two words to each other. That's sad. Start. Start from today. We talked about these open-ended questions that we can ask our loved ones. These work for our kids, too. Ask them stuff like, what's your biggest goal in life? What do you want to achieve in the next five years? What's stressing you out? Right? Who's your best friend? What's your work like? What's your average day at work? You know, I never asked you that question. What do you do at work? Or what is it like? Like ask open-ended questions where the answer can't be yes or no, where they're forced to kind of talk to you a little. Okay? And so if that's the case, then that's a problem if you don't want to spend a long time with your spouse. And if it's because you know you're so attached to your children that you don't want to leave them, that's another problem. Okay? Um, Jibreel Ali Salam, right? He came to the Prophet and he told him, love who you wish to love. And know what? And know that one day you're going to be separated. So love what? Moderately. To love your kids or to be so attached to your kids to the extent that you don't want to leave them and go out with your spouse, that's it's not healthy. And if that doesn't work, my answer will always be seek counsel, ask for help. And remember, what did I say? What was my disclaimer in the beginning? Anybody remember? This is a session of psychoeducation, not psychotherapy. Right? And I know a lot of these questions, they're because we really, really need answers. But a lot of these questions show me that your relationship needs some help and that you should consider talking um, to a professional. Okay, so there's this question that I don't really understand. Is there anything called care too much? Can someone be too something by love? How does individuality prevail in a relationship? So I don't really understand this question, but what I get from it is a lot of times when we get married, we lose ourselves. 
And I think that's a little more prevalent in the sisters, right? Because maybe pre-marriage, they went to school, they got an education, and maybe they were working, and then they get married, and then what happens? They get married, and they get pregnant, and they start having children, and then what happens? All their focus is at home, and they become lost. And that's why research suggests that one of the most important things is for a husband to support and help his wife fulfill her dreams, right? And to give her that time to do something. For example, maybe go volunteer once a week or do a side business online or even get a part-time job, something that will fulfill her. And so that's my answer to this question, and I hope, and I'm sorry if I didn't understand it correctly. So what does a couple do if they're having problems, but one of them does not want to go for therapy? And who do we approach if we feel like we are getting abused? Okay. So first and foremost, abuse is not okay in any way, shape, or form, not physical, not emotional, not financial, and not spiritual. You must be thinking, what's spiritual abuse? Yes, there's a such thing called spiritual abuse, where someone starts quoting ayat and hadith to try to control and manipulate you. That's called spiritual abuse. And so there's no tolerance for that in our deen. I read a hadith that was... Um, it was very eye-opening. So does anybody know the instance of Ta'if? Ta'if, what happened in Ta'if? Come on, we know this thing. The Prophet says, I went to Ta'if, and what did they do? They stoned him, thank you. And then, what did he do? He made dua. And what happened? The angel of the mountains came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah Taala has sent me and told me that if you want, I will destroy all of those people who hurt you. And what did he say? No. Right? Guess what? A woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu She said, Ya Rasulullah, my husband beats me. You know what he said? He said, go tell him right now that you're under the protection of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu So she left. She came back. She's like, Ya Rasulullah, he hit me again. So he took a piece of his shirt and he ripped it and he gave it to her. And he said, go show him this and tell him you're under the protection of Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu And she came back and she's like, Ya Rasulullah, he hit me again. You know what he did? He raised his hand. And he said, Oh Allah, destroy him. Oh Allah, destroy him. Oh Allah, destroy him. What does that teach you? There's no tolerance for abuse in our beautiful being. And I'm not just talking about sisters being abused, because guess what? Studies now are showing that one in every five men are abused in relationships. Verbally abused, and there are some who are physically abused. And so abuse is not okay. And we talked about it, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish those who harm others. Okay. So what do you do if you're in an abusive relationship? You get help. Um, there's a video on my Facebook page where I describe all of the outlets. It's called domestic violence. I describe all of the outlets and places and resources where you can go to get help, inshallah. And if... The other question, if you're having problems and one spouse does not want to go for therapy, what I would do is I would go to someone that that person respects and loves and um, might take their advice and I would explain to them how important it is to save our marriage that we go see someone and please help me convince my spouse to come seek therapy. Wallahu Another question about my spouse not wanting to go to therapy, how can I convince them to seek counseling or understand me? Like I said, and this person saying, well, 
his parents are also on his side, and so they have some cultural beliefs about his roles and responsibilities of women in a man's life. Um, maybe I would go to someone like the Imam of the Masjid. Right? And I would say, hey, you know what? I you know, I really value my relationship, um, but unfortunately we have some issues and we need help and unfortunately my spouse is not open to getting help. Please help me convince them. Right? I would do something like that. And of course, lots of da'a and lots of da'a. Do I know the therapist in this area? Dr. Rania Awad is here. You guys have the best therapist ever, mashallah, Allah about it. And I also know that there are two other therapists, right? And inshallah, Brother Munir can share that information. What are some good books, websites to help uh, understand the opposite gender? I'm going to do a shameless plug. I actually authored a book called The Sunnah and Science of Marriage. Um, you can go on my website, inshallah, pre order that. Uh, I also wrote some articles that you can find on my website. Um, other than that, there are some really good resources. I love the work of Dr. John Gottman. I'm actually certified through the Gottman Institute, so I think that he's absolutely amazing. Um, if you Google John Gottman, you'll find about 50 books that he authored. One of the most... Um, popular and famous book is this book called The Seven Principles for Making a Marriage Work. So it's Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. And like I said, I uh, have also authored a book that's similar to the Gottman method, but I've also paired it with the Sunnah and the Quran. Um, that's why it's called The Sunnah and Science of uh, Marriage. The Sunnah convention. So I mentioned that for all actions and relationships, we should expect the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you also mentioned that we should show appreciation to our spouse. My question is having expectation of appreciation from our spouse. Okay. So it's natural, right? It's natural to want someone to to appreciate you, right? And that's why I was trying to be very balanced where I said, yes, you know, you're doing it for the sake of Allah, so you're not getting hurt. But at the same time, the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever does not thank the people has not thanked Allah. And Shaytan said that um, one of the things that he's gonna do to make us, to lead us to the hellfire is to make us ungrateful. Ungrateful to what? Ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ungrateful to his creation. And so when we're ungrateful to the creation of Allah, we are actually ungrateful to Allah. And so there's so many ahadith, and actually I also offered a book on gratitude. You could also order that book, where it teaches us the importance of practicing gratitude, um, and the benefits, and practical steps on how to become a more grateful person. And gratitude and appreciation, and I did say this, is one of the most important things that we can do for our relationships. We have to appreciate and notice everything, even the small things, right? So even when your spouse makes you a cup of coffee in the morning, even though they do it every day, they've been doing it every day for the past 40 years. For the past 40 years, every day, you should be saying, Jazakallah khairan, thank you so much, the coffee's perfect. You always know how to make it, just like I like it, right? Um, I remember the brothers are gonna like this one. I remember once I was talking to one of my sisters, so I was telling them to appreciate the fact that their husbands work, and when they come home from work every day, they should say something like, thank you so much for working so hard. And one sister stood up and she's like, but he's supposed to work. And I'm like, no, he really is not. I know a lot of men who sit home and don't work, so if your husband is working, you should really appreciate that. And the thing about appreciation, is that Allah subhanahu wa says in Surah Ibrahim that Allah proclaimed Himself, He proclaimed. So it's the Adhan of Abdullah, La in Shakartum, La Azidan Nakum, Wa La in Kafartum, In Aladi La Shadir. 
And Allah subhanahu wa proclaimed, He made an announcement. He said, If you are grateful, I will surely, most definitely, increase your blessings. And if you're ungrateful, my punishment is severe. Right? And so what happens in relationships is that when we're ungrateful, what usually happens? Our spouse stops doing those really nice and awesome things that they do for us. So we should we should notice and appreciate everything that our spouse does for us. And that's what happy couples do. Couples who stay happily married, they notice and they appreciate the little things. What happens if you are not married? I don't think really I understand this question. No one want to help me? No. Uh, if they're seeing each other and not getting married, may Allah subhanahu wa guide us and we should get married. Because the Prophet also said that if two people like each other, they should get married. Do you guys remember my disclaimer? I'm not a scholar, so I don't answer uh, questions. So you guys can ask your shaykh, inshallah. This is another kind of tricky question about the hadiths that say husbands should be obeyed. Well, no. Actually, I could answer this one a little bit. It says blind to be obeyed. Uh, the Prophet said that you're not allowed to obey a creation if they ask you to disobey the Creator. So that's a rule, right? So let's say, for example, your spouse tells you not to pray. You can't obey that, right? Your spouse tells you to drink alcohol. You can't obey that. So they don't blind. We don't blindly obey anyone, right? We obey Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Would you please give us a real life example of what love for the sake of Allah is? Is it without our worldly understanding of love? No. No, no, no. It's not. Love for the sake of Allah is an intention, right? It's an intention that I love this person, I love myself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, it doesn't change your feelings. Those same feelings apply, but it's an intention. Meaning what? When I love someone for the sake of Allah, I love myself for the sake of Allah, I want what's best for their after, right? When I love someone for the sake of Allah, I give them excuses. When I love someone for the sake of Allah, you know, I don't harm them in any way, shape, or form. But it doesn't mean that you don't have those same feelings of love and lust that, I guess, non-love for the sake of Allah has. It's just an intention. And that's why we started off what? Before we even talked about the five secrets, we started off with our intention, purifying our intention for the sake of Allah. And that, so that in turn, it would become a great... Um, a great source of reward, right? Because whenever we do something for the sake of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepts from us what's done for His sake. Um, and I've completed all of the questions yet. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I think is very important. But I wanted to ask how the process of counseling works when one of the participants needs severe amount of therapy. They need therapy. They have a trauma in their lives that are affecting their behavior. But yet you're bringing a couple together, trying to work on a couple when the root cause is a person. And I had another question to follow up with that. You said that if a person needs therapy and doesn't want therapy, that you should ask someone who they trust or love to to, to help them. Are, are you suggesting that someone who's not equipped uh, intervene? So not to give some kind of counsel. Okay, so the question was, is I said that if one of the uh, spouses does not want to go for counseling, how to help them, I said to get someone else to convince them, to work on them, to try to show them that 
you know, they need to go to counseling. Not to get counseling from, you know? <laughs> Wait, uh, not to get counseling from all. Of course, not to get involved and, and start giving, um, you know, some kind of counsel because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask those who know. So it's like going, I, I give this example. What would you say to me if I went to the bakery and I told the baker, my tooth really hurts. Can you, can you take a look at it? You think I'm crazy, right? Or if I went to the mechanic and I said, you know what, my stomach really hurts. Here's a blade, like cut me open and see what's going on in there. So we go to those who what? Who know. The Prophet Sallallahu said that we have to go to those who have knowledge of the subject. And also, he also said that every disease, including spiritual, including emotional and mental, has a uh, cure. And to go seek it from the most knowledgeable and the best possible person. And then the first question was about a person who has severe um, issues and they need, you know, additional counseling. Well, the therapist, uh, hopefully the therapist would be able to see that and recommend separate counseling and therapy for that one person who, who has a lot of trauma and issues from, from the past and work with them individually and then later on work on bringing the couple back together because um, it's very difficult to be in a relationship with someone who has, you know, an emotional instability. And so it can do some damage to the relationship. So that person needs to get help and then start working on rebuilding their relationship, right?